And I know we've talked about this briefly in other podcasts of just how it's perceived in in the conventional space. Because I, mm-hmm. I do think that, you know, when we think of gut issues, a lot of times, even the conventional sphere is like, oh, yeah, there is like a brain gut connection, but it's almost viewed as a one way street. I know you had mentioned it is a two way street. And I think that that gets a little lost sometimes. Mm-hmm. Rarely does the conventional sphere take into account how the gut microbiome inflammation can drive issue inflammation in the in the brain and the nervous system Mm -hmm. so yeah i love like datis karazian's work in this area and i i think it can really be summed up as as if the gut's on fire the brain's on fire and vice versa really Mm -hmm. um so I think one of the key attributes of the brain gut axis is that it's just so, it, there's so much interaction both ways. And I would try not to like, just think of it, think of it as a brain down, but also a gut up. I think that yeah. the, uh, that's the area that people tend to miss a little bit more. I don't know. Like, oh, your depression is caused by your gut or your anxiety is caused by your gut. So it's like, they're acknowledging that direction more so, right. but then maybe not working on the brain-based support in order to heal the gut. So it's right. kind of funny, like the two halves are separate. Yeah, I totally get what you're saying about the functional space being much more like the gut is driving everything Yeah, and that blind, the blind, and I think that goes to show too, like what's in the SIBO space, how you can get so blinded by the overgrowth and yeah. the bacteria is causing all the problems and the gut environment's causing all the problems that you can fail to see these other systems. And for those of you listening at home too, like this might be a little jargony already, an axis is just a connection between two systems. Right. So we talk about like, you know, the adrenal hypothalamus pituitary axis. And it's just to say that those things are connected or the, the brain gut axis or the skin gut axis. It's just like a medical jargony way in papers that they talk about things being connected. Right. And it's always a two-way street with any sort of access or in the HPA, it's a three-way street. Um, but I think, yeah, for some people, you need to focus a lot on the gut to heal the brain. And it can be, you know, like 80, 90% of the work can come from one side of the equation. And similarly, sometimes there are people where you need to work 80 or 90% on their brain in order to heal the gut. And then some people are more of a mix of like 50, 50, maybe you need to do a bit of each. It really depends on the case and what makes the most sense for you as an individual. I think there's two predominant ways that the gut is going to communicate with the brain. And you can throw in others if I'm forgetting some, but the two that really come to my mind are either directly because so first off anatomy lesson, the main connection between the gut and the brain is your vagus nerve. It's one of your cranial nerves, comes down out of your brain stem, goes to the gut, and it tells the gut what to do. So it's a pretty big deal. It's the biggest nerve in your body. Well, longest, I should say. The sciatic nerve is the thickest. But it it is the commander in chief for the gut. And the vagus nerve, for all that we think of it, like the vagus nerve tells the stomach what to do, or the vagus nerve tells the intestines what to do. There's also a sensory component or an afferent component where there's stuff going up. So it's perceiving the world in the intestines and the stomach, and it's perceiving discomfort and cramping and abdominal pain. And it's also picking up microbial compounds and bringing them back up to the brain. And then the second thing that comes to my mind is that your gut is where most of your immune system lives. And therefore it has the greatest potential to cook up boatloads of inflammation Mm -hmm. And if you have a lot of inflammation coming from your gut, those cytokines, those signaling molecules circle around and then some of that gets to the brain. And now you've got some inflammation in that's getting up to the brain as well. So those are the two that came to my mind. How about you, Amy? Yeah, no, uh, those are the main ones that I'm thinking of too. I think if the gut's leaky as well, if there's leakiness and lipopolysaccharides Mm -hmm. are like, you know, directly inflaming the brain, in, in ways as well. That's another one that I'm thinking of, but usually that's going to kick off cytokines. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. And going to play a role in the, the immune response and the inflammatory response. Mm-hmm. So those are the main ones that I'm thinking. And maybe let's uh, start thinking about some therapeutics. What are some of your favorite things to do to encourage 
good, healthy gut brain axis work in your patients? Yeah. I, I mean, what I try to emphasize again, is it is a two way street. And yeah. like you were saying at the beginning, some people need more heavy brain interventions and some people need more gut interventions. Yeah. Um, a lot of times what I try to do is, if there's a gut related thing is control inflammation. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, that, that's a, sounds really simple, but it can be more complex. So yeah, it's control inflammation. It's all good. Yeah. If they need like pruning of bad actors, if they need to build up some of the good gut bugs, we'll focus on that. Sometimes yeah. I'll focus on using things like immunoglobulins to sort of calm the inflammation in the gut. Um, well, sometimes again, we'll work on just uh, trying to modulate the gut environment from a variety of different angles. That tends to be how I approach it from a gut standpoint. Um, sometimes I will say too, like if someone needs some support um, for like just digesting, and that's kind of like if the brain's not operating optimally as an intermediate strategy, providing some support digestively can mm. be important so that you're actually absorbing nutrients and yeah. and, and that sort of thing. Um, I would say from like the brain down, so like how to support the brain, I would focus heavily on things that help to turn the microglia off. Mm -hmm. So things like curcumin. Um, I like I like resveratrol too. Like there's some, uh, I would say those sorts of things, sometimes omegas, a lot of times mm -hmm. I'll try to get them to incorporate more, um, more fatty fish in their diet if they mm -hmm. can. So uh, those would probably be the, the main things. Sometimes if, if the brain gut axis is impaired too, I'm going to be more likely to do things like prokinetics. Mm -hmm. help support motility. Yeah. Um, those would be the main things that I would say I, I do. Are there anything in particular that you do? Yeah, I think that the the gut up, I, I'm in line with you. I think, you know, support the gut, the local environment, however you need to support it. So mm -hmm. feed the good guys, inhibit the bad guys. Um, I use a lot of prokinetics, uh, fair amount of probiotics, lots of fiber and prebiotics and food. Um, I will do butyrate supplements quite often, especially if somebody's been on low FODMAP for a long time yeah. and I don't think they're producing enough or if they have a really restricted diet from another restrictive diet sample, you know, if they're doing like AIP or if they're doing, you know, low histamine or low oxalate, sometimes I'll get those people on oxalate or, um, not oxalate. <laughs> they would hate me. Um, I get them on butyrate supplements also as a, a anti-inflammatory, at least for a period of time. Um, so I think most of that we're pretty we're pretty much on the same page with. And I like some of the nutrients that you rattled off for the brain. Um, you know, curcumin is great, resveratrol, omega-3s, uh, green tea and sulforaphane. Also, I use a moderate amount of either as a food or as a supplement, depending on the case. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, if you could get some synergy with these compounds, then, you know, dosing turmeric and resveratrol together is a greater effect than either of the two alone if you were to add those together. So that can be really helpful to get synergy. Um, probably my my best interventions, that is always a, a matter of if people are willing to do it and willing to do the work. Uh, fasting has been profoundly, profoundly wow for me personally. Mm -hmm. And I've started having some patients work on doing some legit fasting and that's been really profound for a lot of my patients. Uh, nobody relishes the thought of not eating for a day or two. But once people do it, as long as they're not like horribly hypoglycemic, most people are like, oh, that was easier than I thought. And I feel really good. And I always joke with my husband when I do one of my fasts, I tell him, I'm like, I feel like I went to the new brain store. Like all, all the synapses are synapsing. I feel like a million bucks. I have no brain fog, no fatigue. I'm like super productive. I feel like a new human. So I've just gotten in that habit of doing like a three-day fast every other month for myself. Mm -hmm. um, and I try to encourage patients when I think it's appropriate to do that um, or like a shorter, you know, a 24 hour fast. And then you can work your way into a, a bigger one if you want. Um, so that's my number one. Um, I think acupuncture can be helpful if yeah. people are willing to spend the additional money on acupuncture. And I think yoga is fan freaking tastic. 
And with the advent of online courses and YouTube, I mean, you could find enough yoga on YouTube to keep yourself occupied through the pandemic. And then when we're out of the pandemic, you can join a yoga studio. But I do think that yoga teaches a specific uh, type of like body awareness and patience and like their mantra of like stay on your own mat and don't don't look at Suzanne who's doing a handstand next to you like focus on your own shit like I think that's really intrinsically healing to the gut brain axis yeah um again it's just you know if if somebody's already working with me and and spending a fair amount of money on that and then it's like oh by the way spend a hundred dollars a month on acupuncture and another hundred dollars a month on a yoga studio sometimes they've got to pick and choose and like do some of it on YouTube or whatnot um but yeah. all of those I think could be really helpful too yeah, I love that you brought up the yoga piece and the acupuncture. I've seen that certainly be helpful. The yoga piece and any really activity too that's focusing on like coordination centers of the brain, I think yeah. can be really helpful. Um, I also am curious too, I think we've talked about it in, in past uh, podcasts as well. And there's some overlap, I think, with like hormonal stuff with this too. But I know... Um, a lot of people with IBS have trauma mm -hmm. and it might be like very past, like past trauma and sometimes even working with a psychologist as oh, yeah. well to discuss um, past traumas and work through uh, those issues can be profoundly healing as well. Yeah. I, which I know we've both agreed and talked about in the past. Um, so let's recap, shall we? Mm -hmm. So gut brain axis, two way street. Some people need to focus on one more than the other. Like for myself with a significant concussion, I probably need to do a significant amount on the brain side of things. Some people maybe can get away with focusing on the gut. I do find that the hippy dippy natural community like integrated medicine, functional medicine, naturopaths, you know, et cetera, tend to focus more on the gut. And I find that the conventional space will acknowledge the gut brain axis but in a really condescending shitty way of like, yeah, your IBS is just anxiety. Here, take Zoloft and get out of my face. Um, and it, there are things that you could do from both ends to really work on that. And I agree, I think we should do an entire episode on the vagus nerve. And then we could do an entire episode on like a, adaptogenic herbs and the herbs that I would use for such things. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be, I think, a good place. And other supplements too, beyond just herbs. Um, do you have anything else to add, my dear? No, I think we covered the gist. I don't have anything else to add. So that is a wrap, guys. Um, as always, if you guys are listening on a podcasting platform, please rate us five stars. That will help us reach more people. Honestly, share. Share the podcast with all of your friends. And if you are on YouTube, likewise, share this link with all of your friends. And if you could like this video, comment on this video, subscribe, ring the bell, do all the things you do on YouTube, that will help us grow this channel, grow this podcast, help more people, and basically keep this rad and hopefully entertaining content coming to you on the weekly forever. Or at least that's the goal. So until next time, Amy, my dear, it was a pleasure as always. Thank you. And we'll, we'll talk again about gut stuff and coffee on this soon. Mm -hmm.